I'd like to move seamlessly on uh, to Dr. Katrina Morton, who's our last speaker before we take a short break for a stretch of legs. And um, Katrina has spent her career as uh, working as a GP on the front line in deprived communities, firstly in inner city Manchester and Nottingham, before moving to Craig Miller Medical Group in Edinburgh 25 years ago now. She attended the first Deep End Steering Group meeting and has been an active member ever since. And for five years, Katrina was also chair of the Lothian LMC and the GP subcommittee, and she remains a member of the Scottish GP Committee of the BMA and also deputy chair of the RCGP in Scotland with responsibility for policy. So a huge amount of hats over many years uh, and lots of wisdom accrued along the way. And she's going to speak to us today um, from her frontline GP perspective. What does unmet need mean? What does the inverse care law mean at the cool face for patients and practitioners? And what are some of the potential solutions? Thank you, Katrina. Thank you, Carrie. I'm hoping everybody can see my screen. I'll start by saying that RCGP Scotland supports the deep end work, but not everything I say today necessarily reflects the college's view. I believe that general practice has a role in mitigating health inequalities. With the limited time today, I will give a brief overview of background and evidence and then focus on some examples. But our work depends on the Scottish GP contract with its emphasis on the expert medical generalist managing complexity, leading the multidisciplinary team and the public health role of cluster groups. An important focus for health services aiming to reduce inequalities should be unmet need. For patients, unmet need represents the health issues that we fail to address and those are greatest for the poorest. For GPs, it is the difference between what we do now and what we could do given the time and resource. I will briefly discuss each of the four areas on the slide as examples of how general practice can address unmet need. However, the theme throughout is a strong evidence base for the effectiveness of the primary care generalist offering long-term relational care. Continuity of care alone brings many benefits, including a reduction in mortality. Chronic diseases at the bottom of the screen here, or what public health colleagues now call non-communicable diseases or NCDs are a big part of the story. Four NCDs, heart and lung disease, cancer and diabetes account for more than 80% of worldwide deaths. But underlying those are the top five risk factors, smoking, alcohol, diet, physical inactivity, and recently the WHO has added mental health and socioeconomic status, recognizing that they are powerful drivers of ill health. Marmot calls these the causes of the causes of health inequality. It is the poverty and marginalization that Sir Harry Burns has just described. We have models of care now which could reduce inequalities. Care plus appointments, which Stuart will discuss further, working alongside patients, developing shared understanding, including of life circumstances and what will help people most. We think of these as new, but most were described by Tudor Hart half a century ago. We've heard from Graham about the steep slopes in mortality and morbidity, seen here in the thumbnail on the bottom right. This Edinburgh Evening News article was written just after the Second Gulf War and reads, new figures show Iraqi men can expect to live longer than those from Nidri, and quotes the 26 years of difference in life expectancy between the wealthiest and the poorest in Edinburgh. That divide has worsened since, and the life expectancy of men in the vicinity of my practice prior to the pandemic was just 58 years. Compare that with Tanzania, one of the poorest countries in the world, with 3 million orphans, HIV and malaria, with a life expectancy of men is 61. So the inverse care law is alive and well in Scotland. The focus of this slide is on premature mortality. That, that is the harsh loss of life in the young well before their time. The biggest causes of premature death, particularly in men, relate to mental health, alcohol, drug use and suicide. And again, Harry, Sir Harry talked about those. Mental well-being is key to all health, and we will return to that later. The pandemic itself has raised awareness of excess deaths in the poor. Those in the most deprived 20% of the Scottish population are twice as likely to die from COVID as those in the least. But that is no different, in fact, from the general mortality gradients pre-pandemic. 
and these differences will persist and grow with the economic fallout ahead. We still have austerity and UK policies which continue to hammer the poor. The next five slides are quick reference ones outlining some of the more specific associations between deprivation and ill health. This study of over a million person years was co-authored by Marmot and used both Finnish and London Whitehall 2 data. It reveals both the contributing factors and the time course for the development of various conditions, the size of each circle representing the number of people affected. On the left is young middle age, that's under 50, and what predominates are mental health problems, self-harm, substance misuse, and obesity. When tracked onwards through life across the screen, those people went on to develop significant mental health me me medical problems. On the right in the high risk and just in their mid 50s, we see the emergence of severe life changing conditions, heart failure, cancer, COPD and dementia. These people are still young and this is the devastating impact of premature morbidity on their lives. It is also the everyday work of deep end general practice. The same study showed the chance of developing a long term condition. The first line here or first column is socioeconomic status in terms of area deprivation, the second in terms of education. All the dots to the right of each line of the two vertical lines indicate that poorer people are more likely to develop that condition, and the further to the right, the stronger the odds. There are very few dots to the left. And the Scottish data shows one aspect of that progression. These are the odds ratios for developing cancer, heart disease, and various mental health problems for people with four or more adverse childhood experiences. The factors driving adult morbidity and mortality, again, as we heard earlier, are rooted in early life, another area of unmet need. And here is the lived reality behind that data, an account from one of my patients, now in her early 50s. It reflects the strength and determination of people living in poverty working hard to manage their multimorbidity whilst maintaining their wider lives. She has severe COPD, severe heart disease and peripheral vascular disease. She has stopped smoking, undertaken pulmonary rehabilitation, exercises daily and monitors her ox own oxygen levels. I know that when she phones me with worsening of one of her conditions, that she will already have worked out most of the medical plan to manage that. We aim to work together side by side. And she manages all that despite what we now know from Stuart Mercer's Scottish data that multimorbidity is particularly punishing for younger people living in poor neighbourhoods. You could look at any of the risk factors for non communicable diseases and find poverty at the root, but there is a growing epidemic of obesity and diabetes in Scotland, so I will focus there for a minute. We have amongst the worst food security in Europe. Michael Marmot estimates that the poorest would have to spend almost three quarters of their income to follow healthy eating guidelines, which are key to diabetes and obesity management. And we must not forget people relying on food banks, which rarely provide fresh fruit and vegetables. There is so much we could do at neighborhood level to mitigate an entire talk in itself. And the inverse care law is pervasive and this data also relates to diabetes care. These are five Edinburgh practices which have a similar number of patients. The bars represent outpatient appointments for those with complex or advanced diabetes requiring specialist care. Attendances are in purple and did not attend or DNAs in yellow. Craig Miller, my practice second from the left, has a much younger population than the others, so should have far fewer patients needing referral. Yet the opposite is true and DNAs exceed others too. These patients missing clinical appointments are then looked after by us as best we can, increasing our workload, but also meaning, meaning that they miss out on specialist care. This slide is also about outpatient diabetes care, this time for all of Lothian. From left to right shows worsening diabetes control. Going from top down is the multiple DNA rate. It shows that the worse the diabetes, the less likely the patient is to attend specialist care, and yet we generally have no outpatient strategy or program to address this. 
and we could mitigate. Text reminders for appointments, which we know work well in general practice, budding systems to help those struggling to attend, community-based teams, or best of all, practice-based services. Here, there is no sign sense of working alongside. So what can we do and what is the potential role of general practice? General practice provision is itself effective at reducing inequalities. However, we are very, very short of GPs and we do not have the mechanism to resource care for unmet need. I have talked of hospital DNAs, but we now know that patient, patients missing GP practice appointments are at greater risk too. This is Andrew Williamson's groundbreaking study of 155 Scottish practices. Each of the four sloping lines reflects missed appointments. From the lowest line, where none, none are missed, to a high level of DNAs in blue at the top. The graph represents mortality over time. Those who miss GP appointments, described by Andrea as hidden in plain sight, are far more likely to die. Andrea and her team showed that the excess mortality applied to both mental and physical health measures. Her study preceded the pandemic, and we can only speculate how digital poverty might have made this worse since. An option in general practice would be to look for these missing patients as we know exactly who they are. In my practice, we are now attempting to more actively follow up those who miss chronic disease appointments with less focus on others whose conditions are very well controlled. But we cannot do that for the rest of our patients who DNA. We're already working at our limits with the patients that we can see. However, given the resource, we could make a difference and I will give some examples. Graham has of course already mentioned the prime example, Tudor Hearts practice itself, where so much of the reduction in mortality related to chronic disease. Tudor Heart pioneered hypertension care and attributed the impressive improvements in outcome to what we would now call continuity, coverage and relational care. And we can do this too. Advice and written information won't work for those facing severe life stresses out with their control or who have limited literacy. Digital and online approaches will help some, but widen inequalities for others. Our practice and its patients are benefiting from different approaches, house of care, link worker support, and relationships with local organisations. The focus is on the patient's needs, including emotional ones, what matters to them, and what they feel might make a difference. This is the Thistle Foundation, which is right next door to our surgery, and the post to the result of a session co-producing a care approach. The design team included some of our patients. We would like to be salutogenic too. And a more, a now more specific example. Hepatitis C can cause severe liver problems, including cirrhosis and cancer. 21,000 people in Scotland are estimated to have the infection and only half know it. There is an association with socioeconomic deprivation and a highly effective treatment. And of course, treatment not only reduces the patient's future risks, but helps break the cycle of transmission too. With short term additional resource, my GP partner, Mike Quinn, ran a hepatitis or still runs a hepatitis C clinic in the surgery, providing treatment to those who had not managed to access outpatient care. He identified, he, he identified patients with untreated infection, including those from the other practice in our health centre. A hepatology outreach nurse with a scanner visited the practice and the local pharmacies provided the specialist drugs. Here are their results. Almost half of these patients had previously been referred to outpatients and not attended. Yet Mike successfully treated 21 of the 26 approached. To put this in perspective, just prior to COVID, the entire hospital liver unit covering the whole of Lothian treated just over twice the numbers Mike did in the same time frame. So how did he do it? He says that the GP-based clinic was so successful as he knew or got to know the patients, reached out to them in different ways and made lots of connections opportunistically when people were seen by others in the practice. He actively tracked them through our appointment system and provided a local welcoming familiar clinic and one which set out to be accepting and address anxiety at every stage. One afternoon, I was duty doctor, seeing a patient as an emergency. Mike recognised my patient's voice in the waiting room 
and let me know that he had been trying to reach her partner for a final test of cure blood sample. Both had attended Mike's appointments, both were with me, so I was able to bring it up and take the necessary blood. They did not see this as intrusive or inappropriate. They acknowledged that they were not always easy to keep track of and pleased to get the final check done. That is how general practice works. Finally, mental health. This was the main focus for over half our GP consultations pre pandemic with escalating levels of need now. COVID has worsened mental health and yet again, the evidence is that those with lower incomes or no work are suffering more. Specialist services are distanced in multiple ways and often the most ill will not engage. Mental health is what general practice does. However, what has transformed our practice is having mental health nurses based in our surgery team possible with our new Scottish GP contract. They phone and see people just as we would, and if a patient presents with depression but has also suffered trauma or is worried about their alcohol use, they can help that, them with that too. They are generalists providing relational care with continuity. They can prescribe and refer. They attend our multidisciplinary team meetings where we discuss our most vulnerable families with district nurse and health visitor colleagues. They have time to intervene more and see patients for longer. This relieves GP workload, but also addresses previously unmet need. Our referral rates to specialist mental health services have gone down. The graph shows referrals before and after just our very first mental health nurse started in the practice. That alone reduces unmet need as our patient DNA rate for those services was 40%. The mental health nurses have also helped the well-being and development of the practice team, who in turn help our patients emotionally. And I'm happy to talk about that further if people have questions. Meanwhile, the death rates in Scotland relating to drug misuse are catastrophic and continue to rise. Our practice supports and prescribes for over 200 drug dependent people and they're now largely seen by our three mental health nurses who also offer psychological input and harm reduction treatment. They provide naloxone, BBV testing and vaccination services. But as we work together, they can alert us if someone is ill or needs help with their physical health. This is another reason why Mike's Hepatitis C Clinic based in the practice was so successful. I will end with this Lancet report published this month and whose contributors included the LSE and the Health Foundation. It highlights that workforce planning is siloed and fragmented with little regard for the overall needs of the health system. The evidence tells us that what reduces health inequalities is expanded primary care provision. These Scottish gradients, second from the left, the steep upward one for consultant numbers, the steep falling, this falling one for GPs, is an inverse medical care law all of its own and one which underlies so many others. We need to reverse these trends and not just for reasons of health inequalities. Tudor's Heart, Tudor Hart's book was called A New Kind of Doctor. We now need a new kind of practice and a new kind of health service. Thank you. And I'll now hand back to Carrie.